Hi, everyone. Um, I hope everyone has been enjoying day one of Anishinaabe Aski Nation's Best Practices in First Nation Education Forum. Um, this afternoon, we are welcoming Ashley Smith and Kathy Wesley, who will be presenting on Indigenizing the Classroom. Ashley Smith is the Student Learning Lead at Quayachuan Education Resource Center. Her role is to support school staff and students in achieving student success. She is an OCT certified teacher with specialists in special education and First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples, understanding traditional teachings, histories, current issues and cultures. And Kathy Wesley is the native language coach at Quayachuan Education Resource Center. She is an OCT certified teacher and specializes in native language and supports educators in the areas of language and culture. Welcome Ashley and Kathy, and we're looking forward to your presentation this afternoon. Welcome everyone. We are doing our presentation on indigenizing the classroom. Okay, we're gonna start with the land acknowledgement. Coadjuvant Education Resource Center operates on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people of Obijigokan, also known as Laksu First Nation, which is part of the Anishinaabe Nation in Treaty 3. We also recognize that this land is a key hub for many Northern First Nations from Treaty 5 and Treaty 9 territories of Anishinaabe Aski Nation. As an Indigenous organization, Quadrant is committed to the success of First Nation students by supporting an education system that honors and respects the traditional languages, cultures, knowledge, and values of the Anishinaabe and Anishinaabeg of the region. So um, like Jessica introduced us, my name is Ashley Smith and I'm the student learning lead at Kirk. Kirk is an indigenous organization that supports language, culture, and school success. And I'm Kathy Wesley. I'm the native language coach here at Kirk. We'll just let you briefly look over our agenda. These is, this is everything we're going to go over today. And the presentation will be available for you after today's presentation. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission released 94 recommendations to all levels of government. These are called the calls to action. As educators, there are a lot of things that we can do and a lot of changes we can make to help implement them. The indigenizing recommendations in this presentation help towards indigenizing education through language, culture, and pedagogical approaches. We have provided a direct link to the calls to action in this slide for you. We're gonna start with a brief historical overview. Residential schools were created to force indigenous people into assimilation with the white culture. The Canadian government and churches forcibly took over 150,000 children from Indigenous communities and families. This is where the colonization of education started with the Indigenous population. Kathy is going to read a disturbing quote about why residential schools are created and so damaging to the Indigenous population. So this is a quote from John A. MacDonald. When the school is on the reserve, the child lives with its parents, who are savages, and though he may learn to read and write, his habits and training mode of thought are Indian. He is simply a savage who can read and write. It has been strongly impressed upon myself as head of the department that Indian children should be withdrawn as much as possible from their parental influence. And the only way to do that would be to put them in central training industrial schools where they will acquire the habits and modes of, of thought of white men. So this is a timeline that shows the residential school system. In 1830, that's when the residential schools started in Canada. And then by 1996, the last residential school in Canada closed. Today in 2022, many students still need to leave their reserves to attend high school, living at schools with accommodations on site or with a boarding family. An example of that would be my grandson and my youngest daughter, they had to leave uh, the communities to attend high school in Sulacote. 
The education system and core curriculum used by most Ontario schools was created for the government and designed from a Western perspective. Although the curriculum now does, does include some Indigenous content, it does not mandate teachers to teach it, it does not prepare teachers to teach it, and it really lacks including Indigenous culture, history, worldview, and knowledge. So today we're gonna to talk about the decolonization of the education system. This quote describes decolonization as a process of undoing colonization practices. So within the educational context, this means confronting and challenging the colonizing practices that have influenced education in the past and which are still present today. So as I've been learning about decolonization, there's been a change in wording from decolonization to a decolonizing education to indigenizing education. This change has come forth from Indigenous people who are taking back their sovereignty of their education practices and are using more empowering language to do so. One example of this is the shift from residential school survivors to residential school th thrivers. So overall, this presentation is going to focus on the recentering of Indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing. These are a few things to keep in mind as we go through the presentation. Teaching using Indigenous methods is necessary and appropriate as long as it does good with good intentions. These approaches to education we are proposing are good for all students. I want to make sure it is clear that it is not appropriate for non-Indigenous people to teach cultural practices, tell other people's stories, or try and influence students' beliefs. So first we're going to look at ways you can try to Indigenize your teaching methods. We need to get rid of the incorrect notion that colonial ways of teaching are better than Indigenous ways. So this involves an active mind shift because most of us were brought up in the colonial ways of learning. Teachers need to step out of their comfort zones and research and try Indigenous pedagogies and teachings. To Indigenize your classroom is to be more inclusive, holistic, and reflective of Indigenous ways of teaching and learning. So the first pedagogical approach we are going to explore is hands-on learning. Western colonized curriculum has a teacher lecturing and the students listening. Hands-on learning is the opposite approach to learning where the students are actively involved physically and mentally with their learning. Hands-on learning is when students learn something alongside of a teacher, a knowledge keeper, or an elder. It helps solidify learning concepts that may seem abstract, allowing another way for students to practice their learning in a concrete way. Most students enjoy hands-on learning and it can be engaging for all students. Native language should be, should be practiced in every subject. It provides an opportunity for students to practice their own language in authentic situations, not just in the native language classroom. This way we can connect the learning directly to their language. We expect students to learn all these new terms and language in school. So in return, teachers can learn some native language vocabulary to incorporate native language into their students' learning. You can reach out to the native language teacher or community members to help you with your learning, with your language learning. There are also many webinars available. Language learning needs to be done during classes, activities, and events at the school, not just a one-time deal. Practicing language outside the classroom helps students create a sense of community with their native language speaking community members. One way to integrate language into the lessons is to use technology to teach language. This provides a great opportunity to work with the native language teacher to bring native language into the classroom authentically. Do not be afraid to learn alongside your students. It shows them you want to connect with them and their language. This is an example of how to use technology and native language in the classroom. After this presentation, you will get the slideshow and can try the Padlet we created that allows students to learn numbers in the language and listening to the recordings of how to pronounce the words. Bringing technology into learning can help students practice and learn at their own pace. First Nations people are an oral society. First Nations people passed along their knowledge, their teaching, guidance, and wisdom orally from generation to generation. 
Writing systems were introduced later, starting with missionaries and indigenous peoples in the 1840s, who created syllabic writing systems to write the first Cree hymn books. In education, oral language is a critical component to learning in all subjects and in all grades. Focusing on teaching students through different modes of oral communication is a practice that was practiced long before colonial education. Storytelling is a big part of indigenous communities. Many of the legends have a teaching in them, so they can be very valuable in your classroom. Make sure that if it is a community legend or a teaching and you are not from there, that you bring someone in who is appropriate to tell the story. Take the time to find stories that align with your lessons and that align also with the community beliefs. Teaching students how to tell stories is also an important part of their education. We need to create time and space um, for students to learn how to do storytelling, focusing on keeping generations sharing stories. We also have to teach students explicitly how to listen to stories as active listening is a skill students will need throughout their whole lives. Talking circles are a great way for students and teachers to talk. You can discuss any subject area in relation to how students are feeling about their learning, exploring students' thought processes, and how they can connect the learning to their lives. It presents an opportunity for students to hear how learning is perceived and received also by their peers. Students will learn how to talk and learn from one another in a respectful, productive way. Circles can also be used for a safe space for students to talk about their lives and any issues they may want to discuss. We have included a generic directions of how to do a sharing or talking circle, but please confirm with your community guidelines with your own principles. Talking, stick, talking sticks can be used in sharing or talking circles to see where your students are at with their learning or emotions. A talking stick is an object that is passed around to a group of people who use it to include whose turn it is to talk and that everyone else is to respect the speaker and listen. Students will need to be explicitly taught and have time to practice this new concept. It does not have to be a stick or a spiritual object. It can be an everyday object such as a rock. Once again, run this practice by your principal to make sure that you are aligned with the community's guidelines. When you think back to days before colonization, First Nations people were not assessing each other performances with exams, written tests, and everything on paper. For me, this is what education was. Everything was on paper, paper, paper. This is a practice we need to move more away from and find more engaging and meaningful assessment types. So one way to do assessment differently is through observations and having real conversations about the learning with students. Another way is to, instead of having written assessments, to use oral assessments. Oral assessments verbally allows a teacher to have a real discussion with the student and show authentic learning and growth to happen. Oral assessments can be differentiated to work with all students while giving specific, meaning, specific meaningful insight into the student's learning that will help you plan for your next lessons. Other ways we can look at switching up our assessment practices is looking at ways to take assessment outside. This could be from measuring a real tree instead of floor tiles to doing artwork outside with real materials instead of bought materials. The possibilities are endless. Another way to indigenize assessment is to have elders or knowledge keepers help with the lessons and assessments. Their knowledge is immense and can, give help, can help give local context, culture, and perspective. Another approach to assessment is not to assign a numerical value to every assignment, but to try a pass not pass option. This can help alleviate some stress on students because in the end, the goal is for students to learn and move forward not to be perfect and analyzed. Another example is to allow students second chances to retry something, and this helps with building their growth mindset. First Nations people did not grade someone on their rabbit snaring skills with a percentage, and if they failed, never taught them again if they didn't get the first time. So we have lots we can learn from Indigenous practices. When First Nations people were hunting, fishing, and building, there were no formal measurement tools. Instead, they used things called personal reference or non-standard units of measurement. They learned ways to 
measure using common objects, body parts, and simple ways to measure and estimate that could be shared with others. Teaching students about how to measure using your feet, for example, as one foot in measurement is a tool they can have to use in life. So to estimate in centimeters, you can use the width of your finger. Children's fingers are very small, so you may end up with a smaller measurement as opposed to a closer to accurate measurement. This is an example of how Indigenous people estimated measurements. This is known as a personal reference as it is using their, their own body. When students are learning in younger grades to measure using non-standard units like paper clips, we could use things from the outdoors instead. Natural materials such as sticks, rocks, pine cones, leaves, flowers, birch bark, etc. Try to think of ways to bring the outdoors inside or the inside outdoors. This is an example of how we can indigenize our questions and activities we use with students. You can use native language in the assignments, refer to places, people, and things that are local to their area. This way students can see a connection to their learning rather than it being something that is so far distant, it is not relevant to them. So this is an example that, of a math question where it uses the word granny and instead of using the word granny, they switched it to use the word kokum. So worldviews are a set of beliefs and values that are honored by a group of people. It is important as educators, we are aware and respect the core difference between Western and Indigenous cultures. Each community is unique, so having conversations with trusted community members can be very helpful in learning. One thing non-Indigenous people have to be aware of is not the duty nor the responsibility for Indigenous people to teach us. Do not assume everyone will want to teach you, but ask respectfully and come prepared to learn. Western worldviews are what is ingrained in the current curriculum, uh, current Ontario curriculum. I've included a link to share some information about the differences in the worldviews. Looking deeper into worldviews and their effects on your teaching style, your methods, and materials will take a lot of recognizing, discussing, and revamping, and time to set new norms for your educational practices. This all does take time and a willingness to really deep, look deep inside and recognize any biases that you may have developed and think about what steps you can take to correct them. Here's an example of two worldviews. Number seven focuses on the Indigenous worldview that human beings are not the most important in the world, while the Western worldview is that human beings are the most important in the world. So that's just one you can think about. Indigenous people used a lot of hands-on approaches to learning, including using manipulatives and the visuals from the land. Natural materials can be used in place of many objects that are bought into the classroom. But also it is useful to use commercially available manipulatives and visuals too. Visuals and manipulatives are great hands-on tools that help all students solidify their learning and understanding. Take that extra few minutes when you are planning and think. Can I use items or materials that are readily available in nature? Can I add a manipulative or visual to make the learning more concrete? If the community you work with allows it, can you use things from Indigenous culture such as the grandfather teachings and connect it to your lesson? Please remember, if you take something from outside, you need to honor it. One way I have honored things I use is when smudging, for example. You take some sweet grass or sage from outside for your smudging, and when you are done smudging, you go put that sage or sweet grass back outside, either on the land or into a fire. When you plan your lessons, it is important to use the seasons to plan activities outdoors. The Ontario curriculum can be taught in the order you wish. So this is a great way to organize your teaching that follows a natural flow with the seasons weather and physical changes outdoors. The indigenous calendar has six seasons. The Gogan, Pichibibun, Bibun, Sigun, Monokomen, and Nibin. By taking learning outside, <clears throat> it's indigenizing their learning by bringing learning back outdoors, building connections with the land and with their own area and culture. 
If anyone has ever taken their students outdoor, it is amazing to see what happens. Most students become more engaged, happier, and more willing to participate. Get to know the land yourself before you take the students outside. Learning outside is a great way for students to learn, but it needs to be planned and have explicit teaching goals. Make sure if you are using, for example, a scavenger hunt you found online, that you customize it to what can be found on the land you are teaching from. And you can always add the native language translations as well. You can also use the five senses. What did they hear, see, smell, feel, or touch? Have them write a journal. This would make them aware of their surroundings while outdoors. Another way to indigenize your classroom is to try more learning through observation. Learning through observation is a skill that needs practice and is beneficial to all learners. This practice involves students observing, listening, and participating in a safe environment from someone who's willing to teach them. A lot of the times this can be done with guest speakers and it allows time for students to learn to be respectful, to listen, and to stay on task. As a teacher, think about how you can involve your students more in that learning process. One example of learning through observation is instead of lecturing to a class about how to measure TP poles, try and find someone who is willing to show them so that they can actually see it happening in a real authentic situation. Next, we're gonna explore a few ways to indigenize your physical classroom. From residential schools till today, schools are very industrial and have a created and are created to serve a purpose. And that purpose is to find seats for students, not to nourish their learning. Students, uh, schools were created to cram in as many students as possible with no consideration for individual students' needs. The setup is students looking strictly at the teachers, not able to communicate or learn with their peers. Schools are typically set up for the learning to strictly take place inside the classroom and are usually not built with any access to outdoor learning spaces. So as a teacher, you need to get to know your students and think of different ways to set up your classroom to fit your students' needs. Using formations like circles makes everyone face each other and allows for conversations and interactions to happen easier, along with everyone being seen as equal in the circle. Schoolwork does not have to be confined to a desk. If a student is working and feels more comfortable working on the floor or working with their work taped on the wall, be willing to try it. The goal is for students to feel comfortable, secure, and to learn. The goal is not is to have every the goal is not to have every student sitting quietly at their desk. Taking learning outside is an adventure and great learning opportunity for the students. To be successful in taking learning outside, you must plan ahead and make the lesson connect to the outside classroom. You can also bring materials from the outside into the classroom. They can be for manipulatives, visuals, decorations, and much more. A great practice is to get fresh air into your classroom as much as possible to energize the students. When you do take learning outside, consider bringing another class so students can bond with other students and learn from each other. When you are thinking about decorating your classroom, keep in mind that all materials are culturally appropriate. When you look at the posters, for example, are students seeing themselves reflected? One example is you can follow and use an Indigenous calendar using native language and the six seasons. It is helpful if students see objects in your classroom labeled in native language. It is even better if those resources are created by your students. Students take more ownership, curiosity, and pride in things that they create. Remember to include all community activities and events in your classroom and make custom posters, bulletin boards, and activity spaces that are relevant to your students. Next, we're gonna look at some ways to indigenize the Ontario curriculum. For some background, the Ontario curriculum is written by the government with their bias on history, especially when it comes to Indigenous matters. Curriculum was created so that each student had the same outcomes for learning, assimilating to, to each other. Most lessons in the Ontario curriculum do not include Indigenous content, and when they do, it's optional. This is an example where in the social studies curriculum, 
The teacher has the option of which community to learn about. It's an option, not mandatory to include Indigenous communities. Now let's talk about hidden curriculum. In working towards indigenizing the classroom, we have to recognize, confront, and make changes to practices that are everyday norms in our schools right now. Hidden curriculum refers to the lessons students learn about norms, values, and beliefs conveyed in the classroom and the social environment that are often not talked about or looked upon. These concepts enforce the colonized education system and are not challenged enough. One issue we recognized as an organization was when we were traveling to Northern communities, there was a lack of indigenous books in the schools. So students were only being exposed to mainly Caucasian authors talking about stories and situations that they weren't familiar with for the students that we work with. At this point, we've sent up three full indigenous libraries to the schools and can you continue to do this to help indigenize the classrooms. So hidden curriculum affects all students and pushes their beliefs, meaning the governments, on a lot of topics, including cultural expectations, cultural values, and cultural perspectives. It not only pushes their beliefs, but also ignores or minimizes the other group's beliefs. A starting point for looking at and making some changes uh, with the hidden curriculum is to go through all the curriculum and try to make connection to your students' lives and, the rea and their realities with your lesson plans. Look at the cultural, regional, and personal interests of your students when planning your lessons. It would also be helpful to reach out to local knowledge keepers, elders, and people who are willing to help in your community. Please ask questions instead of assuming them, especially when it comes to local, um, local issues. Also, it's important to follow the community guidelines on how to thank someone once they do give you some help. This can include things as tobacco ties and offerings and is something to ask your principal about. Indigenous communities have always learned by sharing their knowledge with each other and with the colonial system, this created a barrier by allowing mostly just teachers in the classrooms, not valuable community members. Bringing community members into the schools reinforces to students that local knowledge, skills, and voices are essential in learning. It also can create a sense of community between the students and community members. Students will also appreciate listening to other people telling stories. The stories will always have a teaching in it. Here are a few th important tips for bringing speakers into your classroom. First, provide space and opportunities for relationships with the community and Indigenous speakers. Be actively involved in your community and reach out for help. Next, make sure students understand how important community voices are. Validate that their teachings are very important and that you will be learning from them too. By bringing in guests, it reinforces the importance of community and that their knowledge and skills should be shared amongst the community with peers and through generations. Make sure that you check with the principal to see the protocols for giving gifts or thanks to guest speakers. Remember to be a learner amongst your students. It is good for them to see you learning and valuing their community's knowledge keepers. Bringing in guest speakers and helpers creates community relationships and both parties benefit from the interactions. When we're thinking of ways to indigenize our classroom, we have to think about the materials in our classroom and what literature students are reading. Take a minute to think, does your classroom have indigenous literature? We need to make some changes so that there are indigenous authors of all genres in our classrooms. When choosing indigenous literature, please confirm that it is culturally and regionally specific and culturally sound. A best practice when looking for Indigenous literature is looking to see if the author is Indigenous, the characters are authentic, and it showcases real ways of living for Indigenous people and their worldviews. The literature needs to include content from the past, the present, and the future, and Indigenous peoples, sorry, and the future of Indigenous people. And we need to also focus on the successes and the struggles. New Indigenous literature that focuses on current events and realities is great for students to connect with. It is important students see a reflection of themselves in their learning and reading. It helps strengthen their sense of identity. Um, in indigenizing the classroom, 
It is important to explicitly teach that Indigenous culture or people are not of the past, but are alive today and thriving, something that's not covered in the curriculum. At Kirk, we've curated a list of about 150 books so far that we have sent to communities, and we're willing to share that list if you contact us. We also created Read Aloud Kits to go with those books, and we've also created two novel studies with Indigenous authors and created student and teacher guides to go along with them with the blessings from the authors of, which are Wabanish Rice and Michael Hutchinson. And we'll be presenting a bit on Indigenous um, literature at an upcoming NAN conference. Another way we're addressing the calls to action with indigenizing the curriculum is to create Indigenous integrated units for grades K to eight. They are regionally and culturally specific units to First Nation students in Northwestern Ontario. They are created using Ontario curriculum and integrating native language and culture into the lessons. There are options for traditional and for our Christian communities. They were created by the school success team at Kirk while using Indigenous pedagogies, worldviews, and cross-curricular planning. All culture-related lessons were written by the Indigenous staff. The lessons were created to be relevant to the students' lives and communities here. And it also includes 700 Native language vocabulary cards for more of that in-class language learning time. Next, we will look at indigenizing the classroom by focusing on the holistic child. Holistic approaches to learning look at the student's emotional, spiritual, mental, and physical being. We need to keep in mind all aspects of a student's life while teaching. If a student is having a hard day struggling with emotions, it is better to talk to the student than to go get that curriculum outcome taught that day. In Indigenous culture, there is a strong emphasis on creating healthy, strong children while keeping all aspects of their being in the forefront. This can be achieved by creating a relationship with students so they feel comfortable talking about what is happening in their lives. Be conscious to check on their emotional state, and you can do this with a whole class check-in. That way it does not single uh, certain students out. As teachers, we need to prioritize mental and emotional well-being over a test or an activity. There will always be more days to teach it. This can be accomplished by creating a safe and welcoming classroom where students are encouraged to ask questions and express their emotions. If a student believes, sorry, if students believe they are wanted and part of a community at school, it will help with their self-confidence and their sense of identity. You can work on incorporating time into your lessons for emotional reflection. Talk about what it feels like to struggle, to succeed, and what approaches and sorry, and what approaches work for each student to deal with emotions. It's a good time to have a class discussion and sharing circles. This all helps with their social emotional learning, which is also part of the Ontario curriculum now too. Next, we will look at how we can work on relationship building to help with indigenizing your practices. A big focus in indigenous education is seeing the interconnectedness of the world around us. Students need to see connections between what they are learning and their world. Interdependence looks at all the ways that concepts come together to form identity, relationships, and, and meaning. And what that means in the classroom, as educators, we need to explicitly point out the connections. One way to create relationship building between students and their learning is through a concept called place-based education. It shows real life examples in a setting students are familiar with, their own community. It focuses on the student's own community's unique history, environment, culture, economy, literature, and current events. Students generally are more interested in learning about something when they can see a clear connection to it. So as you're planning your lessons, think, how can I link this back to the community and their values, history, and culture? When talking about culture in the school, please do not make any assumptions that certain groups of students know or do not know the cultural teachings. Also make sure assumptions are not made that every student who is Indigenous wants to learn traditional cultural practices. In residential schools, Indigenous <clears throat> people were forced to forget their culture, language, and ways of life in a very negative way. Make sure these practices are encouraged, accepted, and allow students to form their own identities at their own pace. In the Indigenous culture and practices, relationships are very important. 
Building teacher and student relationships is an important part of teaching and being culturally responsive. Positive relationships are vital in students being receptive to learning. Teachers need to get to know their students and understanding what knowledge they bring to the classroom. Get involved in extracurricular activities, community events, and taking the time to build relationships. Building trust in the education system comes from students having real authentic relationships with their teachers and teachers approaching this by looking holistically at the child. Students need to feel a sense of belonging in their community. As a teacher, you can look for opportunities to help out in the community, reach out to organizations and groups. Ask your students where they feel there are gaps with their attachment to the communities. Volunteering to help out can help ingrain students more into their community. Some examples are having students clean up a feast area for a hunter's festival or invite elders into the classroom or outdoor settings to share community stories. The last place we're going to look at for relationship building is fostering community, fostering connections between students. Students need to create relationships with each other and all will be different. Taking time to do activities, sharing circles and building trust will have students be more willing to communicate and participate. Students need to feel safe to share and have a classroom committed to learning, growing and being, being there to support one another. So on a final note, these are just some reminders about Indigenized in the classroom. We have touched on just a few things today in our presentation, so please explore more ideas. Indigenized in the classroom is an ongoing process. It confronts and challenges colonial ways and sometimes will feel like a very heavy but necessary step that needs to be taken. Overall, Indigenized in the classroom is bringing back Indigenous ways of thinking, learning, and living. These practices will not only benefic benefit Indigenous students, but all students, thus creating change in Canada. Indigenized in classroom needs to happen in all aspects of their life, from the classroom to the school activities and events. Please remember to support one another and remember that some topics are triggering for people and that sports need to be put in place ahead of time. Remember to keep high expectations for yourself, other teachers and students during the process. When teaching about native spirituality or religion, ensure respect is given to both and no personal bias is allowed. Do not be afraid to question, challenge, and confront colonial education. Be the voice of change. Do your part in making the education system inclusive, supportive, and respectful of all Canadians. Miigwech. So we're ready for the question period if you're ready there. All right, thank you very much, Ashley and Kathy. That was a great presentation. So we're being, go, going to check and see if anyone from the audience has uh, any questions. Okay, so while we are on the Q&A, we do have um, the first question is, where would where do I start with indigenizing my classroom? I can start with that. Um, you could start by talking with community leaders to see what they would like to see in their schools. Um, changing the setting in the classroom, adding some um, native visuals to your classroom is always a great start. Um, visuals could be posters, syllabics, art, paintings, um, anything that is um, appropriate to your community. Um, bringing in more language into the classroom, finding ways to bring it in daily would be a great place to start. And having an Indigenous library in your classroom is a great way for students to learn more about their own culture or if they're non-Indigenous to learn about another culture and the history of Canada. Great, and I do see there was a comment in the, in the, uh, the side chat. It says comment from Tara Constable. Um, it says, I think we're making such great progress with this flexible seating options and kids moving around. COVID has made it so difficult. Seeing desks back in rows in my classroom was very hard for the last two years. I can't wait to get back to a new normal. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah, it, it has been very challenging with COVID to make a lot of these things happen, but fingers crossed we're going in the right direction right now that we'll be able to get back to uh, making learning and the environment uh, more accessible for all students. 
Oh, we do have some more questions coming. Um, have you seen a difference in students and the school when the school has brought in Indigenous literature, language, and resources? So have you seen a difference in the students in school when this is brought in? Yes, uh, usually there is a difference with the students. Um, what I've seen in the past uh, when I was teaching too is, um, for example, when you bring a speaker in, like an Indigenous speaker, like the students just really get excited and they want to listen to what this person says. And even if it's if they want to, if they are going to be taken outdoors, like they get right excited. When I was teaching grade seven, eight, I brought in um, an Indigenous novel for our novel study. And it was amazing seeing the difference of um, how and how much they wanted to read the book. I would see them trying to like sneak it out to take it home to read it. So, you know, instead of waiting to read along with the class, because they could see themselves in the literature, they could see themselves in the situations, you know, they were talking about the sea dews and going out into the bush. And that's not something they were reading in a lot of different novels. So they really found that personal connection made it a lot easier um, for learning for them. That's great. There is another question here. Ooh, it says, how could I indigenize virtual learning? You can, um, for talking circles, there is a way to do those um, online. During my courses, we did them where we had like something that we would pass around and we would still do those same practices. Um, it just takes some time to think about it. When you look at this, think, okay, how can I bring this onto virtual. It'll just take a little more work, but maybe Kathy has some ideas there. What I was thinking of too, like uh, you can also show beading online, like um, how to make stuff. You can also um, do paintings, like a lot of people like to paint. Uh, you can also do that. And you can also even like bring an instrument on uh, your Zoom session and maybe sing a song, make up a song in Ojibwe play your guitar or whatever. A lot of these approaches can still be done online, like having, you know, guest speakers or elders in to share their knowledge that can still be done online. Um, we can still use the indigenous um, literature. We can still have the different approaches, more of like the indigenous worldviews than the Western worldviews. You can be used the language over Zoom. So there's lots of different ways to still have it incorporated over virtual. This is great. I'm loving all these. Uh, I'm loving the Q&A. This is really good. Um, so I guess we have time for another question. Um, so the question is, how do I make sure that indigenizing practices are specific to the population that I am working with? Kathy, I'll let you take this one. Um, you you can get to know the community. I would get to know the community and I'd also talk to community members. Like uh, usually when you go, when you're new to a community, you want to get to know the people. So going out, talking to them and finding out what's going on in the community, the things that they do. You can also do some uh, research, like, you know, about the community that you're going to, like say if you're a new teacher, you're going out to a community somewhere, you can do some research on that community to find out um, some of the things they do. Sometimes uh, communities post stuff online that they do. All right, great. I'm just checking if anyone else has any more questions. We have, we're nearing the end now. All right, so that looks like that is it for Q&A and it's perfect timing. And you, that was a great, great informative presentation. Um, Thank you. you we thank you guys so much for being a part of this and we look forward to seeing you again at future NAN uh, events and activities. Um, okay, so now I need to remind everyone to write down the code and enter it during our break that's coming up next. So the code word is tradition. Um, we're gonna have a short break but make sure that you get your codes entered in to be eligible for prizes um, on day two. All right, enjoy your break. Thanks again, everyone for joining us. Have a good afternoon.